and gentlemen, all aboard the hype train this morning for Atlas. Thanks to a forum user named Bucky for posting this link to Philip Awar's PC Gamer article about all new information, including this baby right here, the Hydra. What you need to know about this mini boss. So this is going to be some sort of area or world boss, and it looks to be like some sort of dossier right here, right? But there's also some other portions of the article that show similar type things, so maybe this is just a little tip screen in the game based on when you get to this area. But the boss itself, first of all, fire breath, lightning breath, gas breath, darkness breath, and cold breath. So, elemental effects and possibly resistances for stats or maybe materials for armor types. And maybe weapon effects, who knows? Fire, breath lights enemies on fire as you can expect. Lightning, a beam that stuns enemies. Gas, a projectile whose area of effect drains stamina and health. Darkness, projectile darkness AOE reduces vision and outgoing damage. It can also spook tame critters like a UD. Cold breath that encases enemies in ice, slowing them down to a crawl. Only the heads are vulnerable to damage, so don't waste your time attacking the body. All five must be destroyed if you want the kill. And if you take too long, destroy its heads will grow back. Regeneration. This thing is going to be crazy. So apparently the mini boss was shown by Wildcord to Philippa and it lived on a Mediterranean looking island and huffed dreadful breath at its attackers. As you might assume, the challenge was to destroy the monster's heads before they regrew and to destroy the whole monster before it destroyed your crew. Sounds amazing. Let's talk about some of the more interesting portions of the article aside from this epic, epic Hydra. So here we start talking about ship battles. To get a flavor of how ship battles might play out, Steven Messner joins me aboard the enormous ship and we set sail with a mixture of game developers and NPCs for our crew. As a captain, I take the steering and sails while Lieutenant Steven deals with cannons. The galleon we are using would represent thousands of hours of effort and experience if we were playing normally. Thousands of hours! That sounds like it's going to be on a massive scale for a large company to take care of. And there's some ideas in there that ships will have to level up. Theoretically, be a lot more conservative in battle and less likely to, for example, ram it directly into another team's sloop instead of turning the boat to use the cannons. Steering takes a bit of getting used to. A and D, which are the keys on the keyboard, represent turning the rudder to adjust your direction. But holding shift at the same time mean those buttons change the direction of your sails and they have to alternate between the rudder and the sails to try to bring it down in position. So he also mentions that Steven takes aim checking the cannonball's flight path on his screen before firing. Cannonballs are extremely heavy things so you can quickly learn to take into account the enemy's ship speed and course so the ammo makes contact instead of splooshing harmlessly into the water. Keyboard commands offering varying degrees of control. Free fire mode lets any NPC on a cannon shoot automatically when they can find an enemy target. And another button acts as a universal hold fire signal. Red alert forces all NPCs to leave their stations to attack an enemy who has boarded the ship. Players can also set individual options for their NPCs. Sort of like pets, I presume. So they talk about having trouble steering the ship because the wind is against them. So it's going to be something skill based with all sorts of different factors and getting close enough and some speed up to try to ram the sloop. They don't make contact, but they said they were tempted to use a grapple hook onto the enemy deck and trying a bit of stealth killing. Now I wonder if that's skill based for NPCs not to actually notice you by being quiet, or if you're just trying to be sneaky and hide behind stuff to avoid line of sight. And apparently dying doesn't take you out of battle because you can respawn in ship's beds, sort of like you already can in Ark. But look at this, leveling up the ship 
can increase the number of beds it holds. Is that leveling up from experience that you get like a dinosaur gets in battles and killing stuff? So many questions. So from the on the map treasure hunting tips, there's an assortment of little things that I assume that we'll see in game in some sort of tool tip or dossier. But the article reads, finding the treasure involves a cartography challenge where you need to match the shape of the land in the map segment with an island in the game. The map might also be rotated slightly, so there's a light visual puzzle element. He goes on to say, it takes a little while to get there by sloop, but the maps requiring further journeys will yield better treasure. It takes us a little while to get going because the dev team want to show us land travel methods like a carriage pulled by bears. From that carriage, he's able to shoot a moose with an arrow out the window and drag it to his friend's feet and then goes on to get in the water and punch a manta ray, which is harder than he thought. So all of this Army of the Damned stuff come from ghost ships or ships of the damned in Atlas. They're used as a source of NPC crew. If you sink a ship of the damned, you free people who's trying to enslave and you can recruit them for yourself. All of it matters with cash flow because if you don't pay them, they will mutiny. So it goes on to say that they use their cannons to finish off the ghost ship and go out to the treasure island. The map holder is the only one who can see the exact location of the treasure on the screen. So he guides us across the rocks. Soldiers of the damned guard the treasure chest, so we need to take them out before digging up our loot. Treasure is distributed across all nearby crews, so we get a paltry sum for our efforts in the end. One solution to the low earnings embraces the spirit of piracy, to team up with others and go on the treasure trip, then betray them once the ghost soldiers are down to get a better share of the gold. So they talk a little bit about the starting zone and how you're immune to PvP there, and instead of punching a bazillion trees, you get experience and kind of learn the ropes, but they're level capped. So about a half an hour, you'd head out on the basic shift, probably a raft, seeking resources and experience. Different biomes offering unique resources and creatures, and by extension, and as you claim more territory, you have more vision on other territories. In the map, granting valuable knowledge and what other companies are up to. Discovery zones also encourage players to wander into new territory, similar to ARK's Explorer notes, offering story tidbits and so on. But there are far more of them, over a thousand in the early game access launch. To reach the highest level in the game, you'll need to find all of those discovery zones. That means visiting the land masses and engaging in difficult journeys. So it's gonna reward you for exploring the map. Claiming areas take time, and your reward is a plot of land that only you can build on. Other companies can try to take that land, and if you're not in the area, you'll get a notification that you must decide whether to try to defend it. If you're in the vicinity, they'll need to take you out before they can start the counterclaim. That sounds like a pretty interesting mechanic. And then they go on to discuss vaguely a few other topics like Cyclopses, a vitamin system, skill trees, a World War II plane that's part of the game's modding aspirations, a cow at the top of a tower, and magic tech involving blueprints for airships and submersibles from a now-vanished golden age. Then they talk a little bit about the character aging system, which at first will be cosmetics only, but later it will be a gradual applying buff or debuff to stimulate the effects of time, requiring players to either find a fountain of youth or risk permadeath, after a few months. Then they talk about multi-generational character systems involving mating with other players in order to create babies and then raising the babies to the age of 20, at which point you can do a body swap to stave off death by becoming your own progeny. And finally, they talk a little bit about the performance of this new engine versus the old engine that Ark ran on and how it should be more optimized, and some transparency things about pricing and stuff like that, learning their mistakes from ARC. All in all, so hyped about this news, guys, and all of these cool gameplay mechanics that are introduced. And finally, some new release screenshots from the Discord that Jat posted. This apparently is a pirate riding a cannon. For the record, he says, you can't actually ride cannon mobiles in the game, but you can latch them onto cargo carrying beast of burden. The next image is captioned deep within the Eastern temperate region. An intense battle takes place as a company furiously defends their mountain fortress against a cavalry 
charge aided by mobile field artillery. I'm guessing that's some of the mobile field artillery there. Someone on horseback shooting some sort of gun and of course this guy shooting a cannon. And again we get a good look at the type of building that may partially be map asset, partially town, as well as this view here with a ton of surprises I'm sure that'll be in store for us guys. I'm gonna link this article in the description below for you to read at your leisure as well as try to keep you up to date as much as possible on all the upcoming information for Atlas. I'm so hyped for this game in a few days. Guys, we'll see you next time. Thanks so much for watching. As always, this is Uljin signing off, and we'll see you next time. Break it down.